Germany finally rolls out its long-awaited China strategy and warns businesses not to get too cozy with the market over there, which, incidentally, is quite a lucrative market. But what does the strategy mean? Does it have teeth? Will it stop a car company like Volkswagen from pulling some 40% of its revenues from China? Well, my colleague Clifford Coonan is here to help us to help break it down for us. Uh, Clifford has spent uh, or spent more than uh, well over a decade in China covering uh, politics and markets there. Um, I, I want to begin with sort of an overarching question. Why should we care at all that Germany published a strategy document to China? Well, the reason why this is so important is that Europe's biggest economy has created a framework for how it deals with the world's second largest economy. And that has implications for the whole world, for how we deal with China, how we deal with China's rise, how we deal politically, financially, economically with the rise of China. Uh, for many years, it, just to talk about when I was there, every year Germany would arrive. The German Chancellor would make a visit to China every single year. They would stay in the Kempinski Hotel in Beijing with a huge business delegation and they would sign billions and billions of, of euros worth of deals every single year. Suddenly, the Chinese economy became the sig second biggest economy in the world. And as China's influence grew and attitudes to China have changed, Germany has to rethink how it, how it deals with that. And so this document is a very, very important part of that. And those business ties from all those signings, uh, they remain. They've only gotten deeper in many ways. Um, I, I'm assuming that many of our viewers don't follow German politics that closely. So maybe help uh, us understand, for the layperson, how this document was regarded by the parties here. It was, it was controversial in many ways, coming out with a cohesive strategy. Yeah, I mean, how Germany deals with China has, has been controversial for many years. The US has hardened its stance towards China because it sees its rise in some ways as a, a malign elements to the rise. And they want to, in some ways, reduce dependence on on um, on China, whereas in Germany there's been much more much more focus on trade, um, and in some ways a lot of the the more difficult political issues uh, have been have been pushed aside. Um, the pro business lobby has been very strong in in um, driving how the government deals with China. Um, now, since the Ukraine war, where we saw mm -hmm. uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, German firms were left exposed. The government was forced to come in and help them bail them out, and also. People start asking questions, why was Germany so deeply involved in, in Russia when it was clearly a bad actor? Now, That's cast a shadow over this relationship with China. Absolutely, because China is backing, in many ways, Russia's mm -hmm. uh, war in Ukraine. Um, it's certainly not condemning it. And, um, and it also highlights the fact that there's a sort of an exposure there, there's a potential there. Where China, for example, to invade Taiwan, which the German government has committed to to, to help in, in, in the event of such a thing, then suddenly German firms would be left massively exposed, like VW that you mentioned earlier, mm. BASF. Um, all these companies have, have massive exposures to China, but things can change, as we learned from Ukraine, overnight. Pretty fast. Um, and, and going beyond Taiwan, of course, we've seen with uh, Xinjiang, with the controversy over there, uh, UN recognized forced detention, uh, forced labor going on um, in Xinjiang province, the western province of China. Also with what's happened with Hong Kong in the last year, a lot of reasons uh, that businesses, that activists have taken another look at China uh, and the way it's dealing with things. Uh, but Taiwan, of course, help me understand, the, why are we talking more about Taiwan right now? Maybe for our viewers who don't understand, Taiwan has always been an issue in terms of uh, its relationship with China, the way the West understands it, the way China understands it. Well, the, the problem with Taiwan, as far as the West is concerned, is that it's a, a, a democratic island um, where when, when China lost the civil war in 1949, uh, sorry, when, when the, at the end of the civil war in 1949, mm. when the Communist Party won, uh, the opposition nationalists moved to Taiwan. And there they set up this um, a sort of a government in exile, as it mm. were. And it's now a self-ruled island of 23 million people, um, which the US and the West has generally long backed. While they give diplomatic recognition to China, uh, they still also recognize Taiwan's right to exist. And how that right to exist is, is maintained is by a sort of a vague relationship called the One China policy, where people sort of kind of agree not to make too much of an issue of it. However, in the, re in the past few years, China has become more aggressive in saying that it wants China, it wants Taiwan. So this is going to put the West into a difficult position. Uh, this document that we've been talking about, it describes China as Partner, competitor, systemic rival. I believe that's the way the EU had already described China. So maybe not any sort of surprise there in the wording. Um, can, some, can a country be a partner and a systemic rival at the same time? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, in some ways the wording is terrible. I mean, it's this trifecta. I mean, imagine if you say, you know, the, this is my partner, my systemic partner, my rival, and my competitor. Clifford is my friend and my rival at the same yeah. time, right. It doesn't sound to me like a great basis for a relationship, but um, this is the problem with the complexity of the China story is that people have to come up with these, these complex formulations in order to create a framework with which to deal with China. Um, because people need China, they need trade with China, and people welcome the rise of China because obviously it's raising the whole region, um, it's having a, a profound, a, a positive economic effect in, in, in the world. At the same time, with that rising economic power, it's using this muscle to, to develop, to sort of, um, it's looking quite expansion, possibly expansionary in the South China Sea. It wants to control trade routes and, um, and it's a systemic rival. The Chinese, it's a communist party system. It's a, an authoritarian government, uh, which is in competition with the democratic systems. So ultimately, that's where the competition is, but at the same time, uh, the West is now constantly trying to balance the needs of the economy with uh, the needs to also protect these democratic systems that we have. You know, the trade environment, we should probably explain that a little bit more carefully here. China is Germany's uh, largest single trading partner, uh, and Germany imports more Chinese goods uh, than it exports to China. That's probably not unusual for a, a major Western economy. Mm. There are two things, however, that really stick out when we look at this relationship. And one is that there are major companies here in Germany, systemically important companies, you might say, because of employment, because of what they insert into the economy, um, uh, that rely upon China for a major part of their revenues. Um, and then there is also the issue of uh, Chinese investment in critical infrastructure here mm. in Germany. We saw this earlier with um, the Hamburg Ports case. That is a, a Chinese company, I believe it's Costco, right, that tried right. to buy, was interested in buying a major stake in one of the, uh, what would you call it, one of the, one of the, uh, the births or one of the, the parts, a part of the port, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and that, that became a big controversy as well. Clifford, will this paper change the first of those two aspects, the fact that Volkswagen, for example, we said, I believe they pull almost 40 percent of their revenues in 2022 from China. Will it cause them to think twice about how reliant they are upon China? Well, VW has has. Um you know, again, when this paper came out, it's sort of saying that it's not going to change its 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 um, its view on China. But VW has been kind of slightly moving some of its investments more towards the U.S. For example, we saw in May at the shareholder meeting where the head of VW was attacked with with cake by activists over the Xinjiang, over the fact the use of forced labor in in Xinjiang. Now, we should clarify, Volkswagen yes, has, has a, a factory in, in Xinjiang. Xinjiang. They yeah. said they see no evidence of human rights abuses. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of criticism because they won't allow independent auditors, uh, the, the Chinese company that, that has a joint venture with Volkswagen. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that's right. Um, then we've also seen that v VW is just... Um, Obviously, with what happened in Russia, again, the Ukraine invasion has 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 thrown things into a new light. Um, I think um, this is where the whole concept of de-risking, which is this word that keeps coming up, comes in. Speaking um, of difficult words and terms, yeah, right. Exactly. This is more of this sort of juggling, uh, linguistic juggling, as it were. Um, and de-risking, it used to be the talk was of decoupling. Nobody wants decoupling anymore. Um, or uh, people certainly want to distance themselves from decoupling and instead they're focusing on this idea of de-risking which uh, just means minimizing your exposure and mm -hmm. um, doing your due diligence. I think companies were probably doing that anyway. I think I would have expected more of an opposition to this policy document say three years ago um, but the Ukraine war and also the reaction to the pandemic when China just shut down. People were stuck in China for a year and a half. VW employees were stuck in China for a year and a half. They couldn't get out. Um, and it, it was just a not, the supply chains were so badly affected mm. by this mm. that people have definitely been rethinking anyway. I think um, it just makes business sense. But that's on the supply side, right? We know that many companies rely on outsourcing, uh, supplying, whether it's outsourcing manufacturing aspects or um, uh, you know, sourcing materials to China. But then there's also the market aspect. This is yeah. still one of the major markets in the world, consumer mm -hmm. markets in theory. It's struggling right now. Mm -hmm. um, but how can you tell companies not to go where people are going to buy their products? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, to take VW as an example again, because in some ways it's very illustrative of how, of how Western companies operate in China, successful Western companies operate in China. Um, the, a big issue has always been technology transfer, um, about how Western companies are, are generally more innovative, um, traditionally been more innovative than, than Chinese companies, although that's obviously changing now. Um, but what we've seen in the, in the electronic vehicles market, for example, with e-vehicles, e we've seen... Um, 
how the market is now dominated by Chinese-made EYD, yeah. EYD, for example. Right. Uh, that technology, some of it's homegrown, a lot of it certainly inspired by, uh, by Western mm. um, by Western models. I mean, just one more anecdote. I mean, on, on this, I remember visiting the Three Gorges Dam, which was this huge hydroelectric right. power um, uh, project a few years ago. And on one side, all the all the turbines were by uh, Westinghouse and Siemens. And on the other side, there were the exact same turbines, but they were Chinese made. And the engineer told me how they had absorbed the technology. So this is that's technology transfer in action. And I think we've really seen that in the car industry. That's definitely what America has long called technology transfer. That's why uh, one of the reasons given for why they've tightened their policies um, around uh, tra some of their trade policies with China. Um, does this paper that we're seeing right now, um, which, by the way, the government says is an orientation, there's no law, there's no specific requirements, um, does it address technology transfer in, in a meaningful way? Um, again, it's more of a framework, as it said. It's um, it basically it it requires that people uh, that China that economic engagement with China should neither contribute to human rights violations or help advance Chinese military capabilities. Mm. That, that's very much in tune with what the what the US is saying. Uh, they've they've cut back on the amount of microchips that they're exporting to that they're allowing be exported to China um, from from the US and from partner nations because they fear that they're going to be used in uh, mili they might have military use mm. um, and this has come into again it's Ukraine you know the fact that the Ukraine they can be used in possibly in equipment that will be used in Ukraine against um, NATO equipment. Right, this isn't and necessarily you, military equipment, but it has sort of a dual use. Yeah, right. exactly. So this dual use thing is, has really entered the debate now, and technology transfer has taken on a new level. Um, yeah. And the US has really doubled down on it. And I think there was pressure on the EU to do it. But within the EU, there's always been this division. There's been, um, we saw recently when French President Emmanuel Macron was there, he, it was in, it was in China. He, he was vague in terms of how supportive France would be in the event of, of China invading Taiwan. Um, he, he rolled it back a little bit later, but the, the intention was clear that, um, that the French are keen to keep trade as, as buoyant as possible. Though I believe the French later came back and said that they still support uh, the status quo understanding of Taiwan's relationship with China that the West sees, right? That, that, that any yeah. attempt to uh, change that status quo by force would be wrong. Is that correct? They did, but there was a lot of vagueness generally about how mm. about France's less than robust, shall we say, The leader position. of the country considers yeah. himself one of the leaders of Europe, for exactly. sure. Exactly. And, and with Schultz, I mean, if you... It's interesting to maybe look from China's perspective on this. China, when it thinks about Europe, it um, it always thinks about France, Germany, and the UK. Those are the three, the, for them, the three main actors in Europe. Now, of course, the UK is a separate entity because it's left the EU, um, but it's focused very heavily on France and Germany. And um, and while the smaller EU states have had a lot of issues uh, with with China, including Lithuania, mm. which has had had uh, trade um, tariffs imposed. Um, I think w from the leaders of these of France and Germany, we've seen a much more ambiguous uh, approach to to China, um, and that's why this document yesterday was interesting. I mean, one thing it was launched in in Merix, which is uh, the Mercator Institute for China Research, which. Because of uh, Chinese, because of European sanctions on China, China imposed its own sanctions on Europe, and one of the Including organizations was Merix. You know, so there's a symbolic thing there, um, and that's very important. It's very important in terms of researching mm. the Chinese economy. So, I think I think there's a lot of these sort of aspects are are, co are coming together now. You uh, you mentioned Lithuania. I just want to clarify that I believe that was uh, we saw some trade disruption. China uh, stopping a lot of trade to Lithuania after mm. it voiced support for. I forget exactly what it was. It voiced support yeah. for Taiwan in a certain way, or there was a visit yeah. or something. They it was basically Taiwan. seen as, as, as unusual by uh, Beijing, correct? That's right. It was a Taiwanese trade office was That's set right. up, and, and, and um, they gave too much recognition as far as the Chinese were concerned. Which we've seen China do with other nations. Australia sticks out, for example, yeah. uh, when it comes to punishment through trade based on uh, sort of political um, uh, statements. I think in that case, it was the, the origin of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, right. right? I think yeah. there was some suggestion or there was an attempt to sort of investigate a little bit more, and then... I think suddenly they weren't in, in, importing or uh, importing as much Australian coal as they, that's they right. used to coal be. and wine. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. That's really interesting because the Australian trade situation is largely resolved. Um, mm. they've, um, China probably needs that coal too. Yeah, this is the thing. This is what people are learning now, 
and this is why this, in, in some ways, why this strategy is extremely important, is that um, that put, there's no, you know, you can push back. You know, these are sovereign issues for for European countries. China now needs um, needs the West in ways that its its economy, its export figures yesterday, um, this week, they were down by as much as they they've fallen by a massive amount, the most in in three years. And if you recall, that three years ago, that was during the pandemic when mm -hmm. there were. You know, when there was other restrictions. So the, right. it's struggling. It needs exports. Uh, also, its imports are falling. It's heavily indebted. It's got a lot of youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. It's got all these headwinds at the moment. And in order for them to, for the Communist Party to continue its pledge to keep the economy growing, it needs, the, it needs uh, help from, from the international community. Um, yeah, and so I, I, I guess you would say then, given the economy that we're seeing, given that they seem to be a lot more dependent upon a lot of these imports, um, exports aren't faring so well, uh, that essentially puts them on the back foot a little mm -hmm. bit. I mean, mm -hmm. are we seeing that in diplomacy? Are we seeing that in any sort of change in regards to how they're uh, approaching some of these nations? We did see that, uh, mm -hmm. I think, the new Premier Li Chang came first to Germany mm -hmm. and uh, uh, France when he uh, made his first official overseas visit, I believe, and that was to say, hey, let's keep business going as usual. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it was Li Chiang. He went to France and Germany, and um, they were very pointed. Um, the language was again much softer. You have to spend a lot of time trying to work out what's happening in China. You have to focus so much on the language, mm. um, and um, there's almost like an aggrieved tone when discussing de-risking. You know, as if this isn't how friends talk about each other. So this is this is very significant, I think, and I think there's a, they feel the need at this stage to um, uh, to to try and, and bring the West back on board. I think China responded to this paper by saying that um, that Berlin's strategy was going to th this new strategy was going to exacerbate uh, divisions. Mm. Um, was this paper likely a surprise to Beijing at all, or how how are they likely viewing it? I don't know. I, I would see that very much in in there is a tone that um, there's basically it's a negotiation tactic. I think the way uh, China operates is that it it adopts this particular tone and. Um, I don't. I don't think it can be surprised. In many ways, it's a very. It's a. It's a relatively mild document. It's certainly there's nothing new in there. The fact it's written. The, the the main point is the fact it exists at all, really. And I think that's something that now that 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 code is there in Europe's biggest economy, it becomes very difficult to to ignore things within there, even if there's no you know, very strict enforcement of it, you still have to be in default. You still have to, you have to do something against it in order to, you know, it, it's, it's problematic. This is maybe one of the finer points of, of sort of the relations between nations that's sometimes hard to explain, I think, in news or, or really portray is that there's this kind of diplomatic dance. There's obviously uh, the semantics of it. Words matter a lot. Things like de-risking versus decoupling uh, matter. And, and China very much plays this game as well. Is that is that not right? Absolutely. And um, Chinese are very, very good at negotiation. Or they've shown themselves to be very good at negotiation. Um, and because it's a single party, it can act in a certain way. Um, whereas Europe is is so so many different moving parts, and I mean this this document is very much the result of of like juggling plates. You know, you're trying to keep a lot of different things in the air, a lot of different views. I mean, if you look at within Europe, you've got France and Germany, Lithuania, um, Ireland, and the UK, which is I know no, long, no longer in the EU, but it also issued a policy document this week, mm -hmm. which is also showing a much chillier tone towards China. So there's all these, the West is very much, um, there's a lot of different things to get, a lot of different ducks to get in a row, as it were. But, a lot of different but, goals, I would imagine. Yeah, well. goals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and everyone's got, everyone's got different priorities, you know, I mean, mm. but ultimately, you know, people realize we have to have a relationship with, that the West has to have a relationship with China, but where they don't do, they don't agree is on how that relationship how do, how do you make that relationship? It seems to come back to that question whether you can be both a partner and a systemic rival at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to sort of wrap this conversation up by looking beyond Europe. Um, when we're talking about nations trying to de-risk, diversify from China, um, either as a market or as a supplier, um, this has to be to the advantage of others in the area, I would think. Southeast Asia, are we not seeing a bit of... Um, We've seen a bit of investment moving into places like Vietnam, for example, perhaps Thailand, a lot of Southeast Asia. Is, is this a major movement that we're going to see more and more companies diversifying um, not just markets, but also where they're trying to get supplies from? Yeah, this is very interesting. I mean, India is another big market. Right, um, we're seeing a lot yeah, more talk, about, a lot India. More talk right. about India. The problem is that there's still a belief. I was talking to a, a, a contact of mine recently who's, who's uh, 
who has supply chain elements in southern China. And he said, we've been thinking about trying to get out of China for years. The problem is that the infrastructure just isn't there in mm. India. Um, you hear that often. Yeah, you hear that often. And even there's, because there isn't, this is the, the you know, China has always been able to act with a sort of a, a singular vision. Um, and whereas other countries have, have struggled and, mm. um, it's it's got scale. I mean, China has scale too. That's a big factor. Mm. So I think I think a lot of it is down to that. But I mean, I think I still think. I mean, India's had a couple of setbacks in recent days where we had um, we had things like the um, uh, there was a chip plant that that Foxconn was supposed to be building. Oh, that's right. Um, but. Ultimately, I think the trend is still going to be you're going to see more there, but mm. the pressure is also on for the infrastructure to catch up with mm. the demand. And that's going to take, you know, that's going to take a couple of years. Sorry, Foxconn pulling out of that joint venture with uh, an, an, an Indian uh, conglomerate. It says it still wants to do something in India, and that's mm. obviously a major goal of the Modi government as well, is to um, to have more of this kind of digital, digitally facing manufacturing, such as chips. Yeah. Um, one thing that we, we touched on, and I think is really important here, is, is understanding... China's role when it comes to climate and um, trying to mitigate climate change, uh, they have a major role, especially when we look at things like uh, EV cars and battery components and things like that. Is it not true that as these sides start to pull apart with trade and if there is de-risking, then that actually puts decarbonization at risk as well uh, when it comes to the West? Yeah, this is always a, a, an area where China's had a lot of leverage because it's the world's biggest polluter. Um, it's, uh, it feels that it can, it's used, it's used its position in, in international uh, bodies um, to sort of push for, for more authority and for more influence. Um, I think ultimately that, that um, <clears throat> the Communist Party is, is loath to, to risk growth mm. to benefit the, um, to benefit the uh, <clears throat> climate change, uh, to stop climate change. But at the same time, it also impacts on its own people. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of, you know, smog in the cities, carbonization, <clears throat> excuse me. So I think we're going to see um, more pressure definitely within China to do something about it. More domestic maybe, pressure. More domestic issue. pressure. Um, and I still think it's going to use it for international leverage. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think that growth is the main focus. Um, China is not unusual in that. Other countries are also much more focused on economic growth than on, on, on climate change. Sure. But I just think that, um, you know, particularly where, you know, you, you saw like with the pollution in the cities in China, how they basically resolved it. I mean, yeah. admittedly, they moved the industries outside the city. But, you know, so I think I think that um, I think that ultimately we're going to have to see some sort of almost two tier cooperation going on. This is going to add another level to the systemic rivalry uh, where that needs to be partners on climate change but rivals elsewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, with that, let's let's leave it there. It's, it's been a fascinating discussion with Clifford Coonan, our, um, our China expert here in-house. Uh, Clifford, thanks for being with us. Um, I want to thank our viewers as well for being here. And uh, we want to encourage you guys, this camera, want to encourage you guys to um, check out some of our other videos, some of our other uh, business specials that have really sort of uh, dug in a little bit deeper on some topics. Feel free to leave your comments, um, your opinions, any questions that we missed, anything like that um, in the comment section below. Um, for me and for Clifford, thanks for watching.